Right, a great welcome uh, to Neil Asherson. Um, Bill Schwartz, Saul Dubo, behind the camera, a meeting Neil at Magdalen on College, Cambridge, on the 12th of March. Um, we've got a big night ahead of us because uh, of certain things in Parliament, but Neil has very kindly agreed to come to talk to us about aspects of empire. Uh, the three of us met at in Gibraltar some months ago at a conference, and this in some ways continues the conversation that we began. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Neil, you've written a range of extraordinary books. Your journalism, I've probably seen a tiny, tiny, tiny segment on. So there are many things we we aren't going to be able to talk about here. Um, it seems very likely that we won't really get much chance to talk about Central Europe or about Poland or about many other things. What we're thinking is we might begin just asking questions about historical consciousness and you know where your historical sensibilities arose. Then maybe to the question of the British Empire. Moving on to a little bit on Brexit, Britain, and possibly think about the relationship to the end of the end of empire to Brexit, Britain, and then we'll have to say something a little bit at the end about Scotland. We can't not say anything about Scotland. <laughs> um, so could I begin by just asking a very difficult, a very broad question about where you think your historical sensibilities? Arose? Did do you always have them as a as a child? You talk about your um, you talk about your mother's interest in Scottish history and Scottish folklore and so on. Uh, did you read Walter Scott as a child? Did you? No, I didn't read Walter Scott, but it certainly uh, would come through mostly through my mother, um, to some extent through my father. My father a naval officer, but he was um, engaged in a bit of history because he was in the in, involved in the intervention in the during the civil war in Russia. So he knew a lot about Russian history, which he talked about. Um, my mother talked certainly about Scottish history, and at an early age, I was being read. Um, history books like Scotland's Story, <laughs> which is famous. Um, disconnected series of gory romantic anecdotes, you know, which you just you have no sense of how one episode relates to another, but the illustrations were terrific. And so I suppose that was a general, I think also the kind of times in which I was a child were times in which people talked a great deal about, mm. were very conscious of history and talked about it. Um, of course, when one says history, that was selective, so it was almost entirely British, either, either British, English, or Scottish history. And um, apart from the Russian exception, I didn't learn much about the rest of the world. But did you, you learned history formally at Cambridge? Yes, I chose. To, to read history, that's right. Mm -hmm. And do you remember what prompted you to choose history? Uh, what, what? what prompted you to read history as an undergraduate? Um, what I remember is being told rather offensively by <laughs> Christopher Morris, who was then in charge of the, the sort of first year history undergraduate, said, you know, well, I know perfectly well you've all chosen history as an easy option, you know, <laughs> but it's not, I'm going to show you. Um, I chose it because I was already interested in, in because I was interested in, in revolutions and resistances and that kind of thing, and the reviving elements of the past, rebellion. Um, I had a romantic view. Did you think of history as a critical discipline? Did I want? Did you think of history as a critical discipline? Did you think of it as as, as about argument and, and, and criticism, or did you think? 
No, I hadn't really hoisted that in. I mean, I was quite surprised gradually to find that there were um, schools of history or interpretation of history who disagreed with one another. You see, you quite soon learned that at Cambridge, but um, I wasn't aware of that before. <laughs> so for me, it was the past, you know, what happened? Viva is what happened, really. Did you find yourself at Cambridge aligning yourself with any particular school of history? I wouldn't have said so. I mean, I was under, the, I was being tutored by several people, Noel Allen and Eric Hobsbawm, who were the main influences. Um, Noel Allen's line on history was very much, uh, well, it's all a matter of uh, who knew whom and uh, <laughs> certain families who tended to reproduce themselves in genius and power. Um, and I was a bit wary of that. Uh, Eric's approach, which was you know, about the people in history, interested me and impressed me much more, I have to say. But um, I, I think, I mean, a lot of the history I wanted to learn, I didn't, it wasn't, it wasn't for sale, in <laughs> fact, at Cambridge. It just wasn't on the curriculum. So I find myself in you know, a special subject. Uh, the previous year there had been a special subject in the revolutions of 1848. So I thought, great, you know, they, by the time I got there it was off. And instead I find I had to do the Elizabethan church settlement, <laughs> which I would, okay, I mean in some ways it really taught me a great deal about what you might call anglitude. Were you aware as an undergraduate, did you take any courses in imperial history or expansion of Europe, I think as it was called then? No, there was nothing like that. No, I mean, at school there had been obviously some basic, I, mean, I was at Eton and the history taught there was certainly quite conservative, straightforward, um, but it certainly included you know, the empire history of the empire, I mean, from a conservative imperial point of view, as you might say, but the basic facts were mostly there. It seems to me that in your writing there are many varieties of different historical sensibility. Um, so in Death of Fronzac, for example, it's a beautiful kind of ethnographic, textured, detailed reconstruction of Greenock in the 1940s, you know, mm. beautifully done. But then if you think also about stone voices, your reflections on Scotland and its fate and future, mm. you seem much more preoccupied with the question of kind of deep history, with archaeological time. Yes, that's um, right. Mm. And you indeed are a professional archaeologist in some ways. Well, I would qualify that. <laughs> I mean, I've always been an amateur archaeologist. I mean, at the age of 15, I was a um, fellow of Society of Antiquaries of Scotland. When you were 15? Yeah. And you're still a member? I'm the oldest. I've been longer member, longer fellow than anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> so I've achieved that. No, but so I did, I've done a certain amount of field work, you know, been drawn into it. But uh, I was always fascinated and excited by it. And in Argyll, um, I was very much under the patronage, so to speak, of an extraordinary woman called Marianne Campbell, mm -hmm. who was. Um, I always felt, uh, well, in after years, I felt uh, she was very much like the kind of type of. Um, Central European, 19th century, uh, small aristocrat. So she was a landowner. She was uh, a clan figure, a minor kind. Uh, she was a um, fanatical nationalist. Uh, she was an archaeologist. Um, she was uh, involved in local politics. She was an Argyllshire councillor, as then was. And she also wrote novels and poetry. 
So this is the kind of figure which you don't really... Well, I think you find it in Ireland. You certainly find the you know, 19th century Hungary yeah. or the Czech lands, Poland, you know, the, 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 that kind of smaller aristocracy and their connection with cultural nationalism, different kinds, and their interest in the past. Archaeology is so, so she was a she was active as it was she a patron or was she of the of, of, of the well, she was a, no, she was a friend of my mother so right. when we were little girls <laughs> that's how I first knew her but um, she took an interest in me and and taught me about archaeology basically and then when discovered I was interested made me a fellow so that's how I became a fellow was so I'd done some stuff on my own about Sand Hill sites, as they're called in Isle of Col, where we go for holidays. So that's how it all began. Mm. And then when I was at Eton, I also um, became a great friend of uh, a man called Robert Erskine, or Boy, who <laughs> was a, he was a real prodigy. At the age of 16, he was um, a leading authority on a particular epoch of Anglo-Saxon coinage, you know. He was terrific, yes, and very. He was very learned indeed. <laughs> he still, still is. I'm interested in um, different ways you have of approaching the history of nationhood and the history of nationalism. Mm. So, on the one hand, you give these archaeological readings, which kind of have these long, deep subterranean histories, mm. and then the other. In your other voice, you're you're very attached to the title of Gwyn Williams' 1985 book, When Was Wales. Yeah. So you're asking, you know, when was Scotland? Mm. But that's much more conjunctural um, and kind of agent way of of understanding history. So it's just I'm interested in about how you can balance these two different perspectives of a historical well, approach. <coughs> it was really. Um I think it was the archaeology which, which, and the development of theoretical archaeology, which I was experiencing, in fact, in the Institute of Archaeology in London, UCL, that really um, enlightened me about nationalism in many ways. Uh, because, uh, I mean, <laughs> the central thing about nationalism is the old proverb about uh, this is my grandfather's axe. My father gave it a new head and I gave it a new <laughs> handle. This is my grandfather's axe. <laughs> and this, so this understanding that um, nations in one sense are not fictions but they are artifacts and they are imaginative artifacts in certain respects. Nonetheless, the fact that they are not much of their the past or the accepted past may be mythological or invented yeah. or constructed doesn't in fact affect the solidity or and intensity of national feeling and and its you know and its loyalties mm. and so it was this ironical combination which is certainly in stone voices but it's also in another book which is uh, black sea yes yeah. which is about nationalism, largely, yeah. not yeah. exclusively, but it's partly so. So, I mean, the thing about <laughs> the advantage coming from Scotland, because one of the first things you have to, it took me some time to realise, I think, that um, there was something different <laughs> about Scottish nationalism, which is that to say, is there a Scottish nation, uh, is not, um, is, um, it is not the same as the search for a Welsh nation in the yeah. past, because, yeah. of course, um, nobody ever said seriously that there was a single ethnic Scottish nationality, because there never was. And people talked about the Kingdom of Scotland mm. Mm. long before they talked about a Scottish people, mm. yeah. Um, yeah. because it was composed of so many different, well, not so many, but let's say half a dozen uh, ethnically distinct units, many of which were quite incomprehensible to one another <laughs> in, different, in different cultures, but were united by, eventually, by 
common loyalty. Did you read um, when it came out in Hobbesbaum's imagined uh, commu- imagine, so what, sorry, uh, invention of uh, oh, national. Ben Nicholson. Yeah. No, the Hugh Trevor Roper piece about the uh, Scottish. Oh, yeah. Do you, um, do you, do, did you uh, take invention that? Of tradition. Invention of tradition. The Hugh Trevor Roper piece, which looked at the sort of uh, the fraudulent invention of the Scottish kilt. Did that yes, I did. I, I read that, yeah. <laughs> you didn't think much of it? No. Because it's very superficial. Um, it doesn't take on board. You know, there's a dual reality which you have to take on board, which is that uh, much is imagined, much is made up, and yet much of what is made up and imagined is, in another sense, deeply real mm. and has to be taken very seriously. Mm. So, you know, he doesn't do that. Can we, is it, can we move to empire since we're I've, talking? I've got one last one question, one. if that's all right. I'm, I, this is a, a curiosity rather than kind of big intellectual question. I just wonder um, how much imaginative fiction has shaped your historical sensibilities, <laughs> yeah, whether from Central Europe or from Balzac or Scotland. Well, it's amusing that you should ask that. I was at Eton. I was an Eton scholar, of course, but nonetheless I was at Eton. <laughs> in those days, Eton was still in some respects, living in the 18th century, <laughs> uh, English wasn't taught. So uh, there was no, you know, English literature wasn't the subject at all. Um, in order to do some of the national exams, I think, I seem to remember, no, we didn't do, uh, we did a Shakespeare play, but that was just an, a- an act, you know. Um, so no, so I left, at the age of 18, you know, emerge into the world, uh, never having heard of George Eliot, um, vaguely having heard of Trollope, because some people said that was what one a gentleman ought to read. Harold Macmillan. Um, um, I hadn't read any Dickens. Uh, I had read some novels of Scott. Um, but basically, I hadn't read any of the English or Conrad, anything like that, you know, none of that. And but I since knew then, there's nothing about it. George Eliot never had of. But since then, yeah. you've read very widely in English and Central European fiction, and it must have oh. shaped your thinking deeply, isn't it? Well, yes, uh, but it's very, you know, my. Fiction reading has been very unsystematic. Um, a lot of it has been trying to catch up on what I should have been, been familiar with, you know. And when I arrived at Cambridge, um, I find all these people talking about things which are uh, authors, which I had no knowledge about at all. <laughs> I did, I had read some French stuff. I think I've read some Flaubert um, by then. Um, yeah, I've read quite a lot of poetry, mm. perhaps too much. Yes, I read, that's right, because I read, I got I drifted into reading quite sentimental um, stuff. I read a lot of G.K. Chesterton, I read a lot of John Maysfield. Um, Hausman? Did you read Hausman? No, I didn't. I couldn't take that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it just, just put me off, you know. Something about it immediately put me off. And, but Maysfield was, I now think it's underrated. Right. Yeah, I mean, there could be a revival, certainly some of the prose. Very interesting writer, actually. Right. Uh, some of the, I mean, some of the long romantic poems are bit sick making I think he says <laughs> but certainly I could devour all that yeah um, when and that was in my teens and I suppose you could say something I discovered for myself and then I remember buying a book uh, by Catherine Mansfield mm-hmm. when I was probably about 14 or something that made a big impression on me oh, but it's sort of kind of scattered happened. Mm-hmm. Um, 
trying to think. Well, then a bit more systematic was, um, again, this is kind of <laughs> typical of, of a certain kind of country, which is rather un-English, I guess. But in Scotland, the, there was a man who drove the post van in North Gilpet and uh, called Pat, and he used to give me lifts occasionally when I wanted to get to Glasgow. Pat was, um, I think he was, in the, he was in the CP, but he was also a nationalist, which was quite, I could say, contradictory, but actually a lot of people combined those in mm. those days, it was kind of late 40s, 50s. And uh, he was very concerned with Scottish culture and literature. And uh, in those days, a great deal of it was almost impossible to get hold of mm. because it had gone out of print, it had never been widely printed, you know, and all that. And uh, so he ran a sort of almost an official lending library, almost as if the stuff was Sammy stuff. And so he told me about Lewis Crass and Gibbon. And um, so I put myself on the list, as it were, and then eventually <laughs> my turn and I got the look at Sunset Song or whatever it was, you see. And, I mean, that's, again, kind of, I don't think you'd find it down here, that sort of Very good. situation. Yeah. Or, or that kind of personality. Mm -hmm. Anybody who was driving around the countryside, you see, in his van, he was in contact with all kinds of people, and he was using that. Oh, that's interesting. And you would accompany him in the van yeah. to, to Gypsum, and then just... Very good. Do you want to get on to Well, we would, we started talking about nationalism, and um, mm. you're a young man at this crucial moment of decolonization. And um, I know when you're at Cambridge, you I'm not quite sure you join or you become a representative of the Uganda National Congress. Is that right? Uh, well, I, <laughs> I became the propaganda secretary. How did that happen? Can you tell us the story? Um, well, I'd known uh, two of my friends, and my best friend at Cambridge, in fact, was a Ugandan. Um, he was at King's the same as I was. And uh, so it was a time of political crisis. Uganda was still a British protectorate, but there had been a crisis in which uh, a nationalist upsurge for independence in the course of which um, the Kabaka, the king of Buganda, had been exiled by the British. And anyway, a bit later, after I left Cambridge, um, for various reasons, I went to Uganda <laughs> and decided I'd go and see uh, these two. And uh, so I landed up um, in Uganda at King's College, Budo, and where they were, one of them was teaching, my greatest friend. I stayed there for a bit and got immediately involved in Uganda National Congress stuff. And we'd been doing this before mm. because we'd been, as I said, that piece of paper, um, <laughs> sitting, writing constitutions, you know, <laughs> for the Hancock Commission at the time when you know, British was very, being very serious and solemn about how could one advance, you know, a certain degree of self-representation in Uganda which will satisfy this, that and the other, you know. So they were requiring um, submissions, so we all submitted constitutions which we made up. Did you meet Keith Hancock? Hancock? No, yeah. not personally, no, I didn't. So presumably, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing, by being Propaganda Secretary of the Congress, you were pretty much on the same side as Oboti, but actually opposed to the Kabaka, would that be right? Well, uh, my feelings about the Kabaka, and those were actually my particular Ugandan, who were Baganda too, friends, was a bit ambiguous, uh -huh. which was, there was a sort of very deep kind of chronic loyalty somewhere, and um, but nonetheless, they did think he was a, a playboy and um, that the kind of authority he exerted, which was ancient, 
magical and extremely authoritarian mm. was not really what the new Uganda should be about. However, the, did you encounter Andrew Cohn? Yeah, certainly. Yes, I did. <laughs> and? Well, Andrew Cohn was... Um, I want to put this slightly in sequence, what happened. I mean, I went to Uganda. Um, after a time, I um, became involved in Uganda National Congress work again. And then they said, could I take on the job being propaganda secretary? This was for practical reasons, which is that I was white. And if you went to an Indian printer and said, could you please uh, uh, print all these leaflets saying, uh, Brits, get out, and we want independence now, you know, he would immediately report you to the police and refuse to do it if you were black. If you were white, of course, oh, you know. <laughs> it was that simple to start with. <laughs> really. um, so shortly after that, I got into uh, a deportation notice from the special branch in Uganda um, because I helped to organize a conference at McKinney, which was um, it was the first time, really, that UNC representatives from all over the um, all over the Uganda, the protectorate, came into one place and talked to each other. You know, what we should do. So I got this notice and uh, I kind of appealed. I did already know them because you know it's a very small community and. So Andrew Cohen was, was large, I suppose, Jewish, uh, liberal. Um, in fact, I think he'd been an apostle. Oh, really? Yeah, I think he was a Cambridge apostle. Anyway. Y you were an apostle too? Yes, I was. Oh. <laughs> and he, um, you know, there were, I was immediately in that sort of circuit to be asked to his. And I think it's only in retrospect that people are beginning to see how enormous that crisis, politi political crisis, which was a colonial crisis, mm. was actually registered in the home state. Were you conscious of that at the time? Yes. Of the, of the power of, the, of yeah. these colonial re re reverberations within Westminster? Well, because of McLeod. Yeah. And we, uh, there was a group of us, Commonwealth correspondents, and we used to go almost every day to get briefed by Ian McLeod, who would sort of give us a drink and talk with terrible frankness, you know, uh, about what Roy was up to, <laughs> the latest from Roy. And uh, he was a happy warrior, you know, he was enjoying it. He was going to get what he wanted. That was his view. No, oh, I mean, he was very enormously likable. People, I mean, of course, that people become likable when they open their hearts to journalists. You know. Indeed, so. I've known a few. So you, 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 uh, McLeod appealed to you. Hmm? Right? you McLeod appealed to you. You, you, you formed a, a relationship. It was you, you enjoyed each other's. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm not the only one, but I was one of the journalists he knew and liked or trusted or or trusted. How much he didn't tell us, I don't know. Duncan Sands. But he certainly told us lots of. Did you meet Duncan Sands? No. 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 I think you'd find him less congenial. <laughs> Duncan Sands, that's a hard man. And what about Macmillan? Well, never came in contact with him. Did you think that he... I mean, McLeod was clearly a big influence on Macmillan. Did you think that Macmillan um, simply saw the empire, the African empire as an inconvenience that they wanted to get rid of? Uh, did you follow the, the Wind of Change tour? Uh, I didn't, no, no, I didn't. Uh, partly because I, Scots, well, I was a Commonwealth correspondent. Scotsman had no money, so I wasn't allowed to go anywhere. And I, <laughs> I wasn't. Well, I was invited to <laughs> go once on a PR trip to Mauritius by the then Prime Minister of Mauritius, but uh, the Scotsman wouldn't let me go because uh, Eric Mackay said you'd need an awful lot of pocket money. <laughs> <laughs> Everything was going to be paid for, you know. <laughs> oh, you need a lot of pocket money. <laughs> I mean, that's said with them, mind you. I know it's proverbial, but you know, many, many years later, I mean, they paid for me to hire a bright orange Volkswagen and drive across the Namib Desert, you know. Blimey. Uh, but when I charged them for a 
pair of socks I bought in CNN in Johannesburg. They wouldn't pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> what were you doing on the Volkswagen <coughs> in, uh, in the, the Namib Desert? Well, reporting all those, do you remember those torture stuff? Uh, Dirk Mudge. Oh, God. Yes, the Namibian, yes, yeah, yes, yes. That's right. This is the negotiations towards the end of uh, Southwest Africa. Yeah. And the, the, first of all, the fighting going on, of course, up north of Swartwell. And I went up to that as well. But, I mean, Windhoek was the weird comedy of people, of course, the Germans complicating it. And, and that's a, a whole other story. But, anyway. but, I mean, by this time, you knew Germany very well. Yes. So you must have gone to places like Swakopmund and Luderitz and seen yeah. this expatriate German community. Yeah. And, uh... <laughs> oh dear, the ones who used to throw this party on Hitler's party. Right, yeah. yes. <laughs> <laughs> can we ask, um, <laughs> can we ask where Belgium came from? Where Leopold II yeah. came from? When I did that? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you why. Because, um, <laughs> well, one, because it was on the, it was 1960, mm -hmm. Chicago independence. Mm -hmm. But two, because when I was in Uganda, um, I did meet a couple of young Africans who'd come through from the Congo, the Belgian Congo. And they were just extraordinary because they were, they wore wonderfully kind of, Exotic clothes, really. I mean, they were like beautiful, shiny, dark brown, dark, brilliant brown leather jackets, and you know, they were very fashionably clothed, which you know, Africans in Uganda in those days were not. A rather respectable kind of Church of England sort of way of dressing everybody had, you know, blazers and ties, and they, <laughs> they have these garish, rather Frenchified, and we've been talking to them. Discovered that they were there was a great big hole in their heads, metaphorically, where politics ought to have been. They had no political ideas at all. Um, they didn't know anything about. They didn't hadn't thought about what's going to happen. Um, they often some of them were quite well read. Can you can you put a date in this? Is this this is late fifties? This was nineteen fifty six. Right. Yeah. Probably. And uh, in many ways sophisticated kids, but politically absolutely no, nothing. And we, 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 I mean, I and Ugandan friends found this very strange. Of course, the whole thing came out in the wash. <laughs> this is <laughs> Belgians. The way Belgium dealt with it. How, how did you explain? How, 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 how did you explain that to yourself? How do I explain it? How did you explain this lack of political consciousness amongst this? Well, deliberate um, um, Belgian policy, mm. which was you know, to um, either you became completely evolue Belgianized, or you got nothing. Mm. Um, so they weren't taught to think about themselves, you know. Well, there were barely any secondary schools, and hmm? there were barely any secondary schools, and no university, as I recall. Well, there was there was a sort of college hmm. somewhere in Kivu, I think. What was it? It was I can't remember its name. In fact, there was an there was an atomic. There was there was an atomic uh, reactor. Yeah, yeah. There? there was. Yeah. But how much is some? Um, how much is Lubumba a present in your Leopold the Third book? Well, he's not. He's not in the book. No, I know. No, but how much was he in your head as you were writing the book? I know. Um, but oh, quite a, well, quite quite a lot. But on the other hand, that is the book is not really about Africa mm, primarily. About Belgium. It's not yeah. about the fate of the Congolese peoples. Yeah. It's about um, colonialism of a particular kind, and this extraordinary vision, which Leopold had very shrewdly which is, I can make monarchy survive into the 20th century <coughs> by endowing it with huge, huge sums of money, they making it economically Parliament. so powerful yeah. that although we can have parliamentary democracy, yet a parliament can't challenge 
the part of the monarchy to initiate policy and initiate uh, direction, new directions for the economy, including new colonies, of course. Do you remember you wrote this piece in the LRB about um, Lumumba? Sorry? You wrote this piece in the LRB 10 or 20 years ago about Lumumba? Mm. And you said, do you remember that, saying that he has this presence? Oh, yes. Everyone well, you were talking to, you know, lock their windows mm. in case the spirit of Lumumba would well, come in in the night and molest the well, white I mean, woman. Lumumba had, uh, he developed a strange sexual kind of connotation with people. Certainly, in, even in London, I remember. Yes. Yeah. It was shocking. But women particularly became just twitchy. I mean, almost, they, they dreamt about the mother. Yeah. Yeah. They say. So he had, the, the whole episode had an extraordinary power, and he did. Um, I mean, he did, I saw him once. Did you? Yeah, because he came to London. Oh, of course. Hmm. I don't remember why. And this is when Hume was um, writing the memo to the State Department saying that crocodiles can, we can throw them to the crocodiles. Mm. Yeah, which I'm sure you didn't know about then, but it's become common knowledge subsequently. Yeah, yes. Um, I remember him because he, I, remember, I saw him at the airport, that's right, it was at Heathrow, and there was a crowd of us looking, and then there were. Um, all these people, you, you looked at them and thought, who are they taking photographs? They're not journalists. Ah, uh, I know. You know, they were South African, actually, some of them. Oh. Yeah. And did you, when you, yeah, did what you happened, Yeah, what happened to say, who are you? Uh, you know, and they got very nasty. Did you hear them speak? No. No, oh, he didn't just speak at that point. About no. his charisma he and whether that was helpful. Sort of angry and bewildered. <laughs> to blow it away into a limousine, I think, as far as I remember. Mm -hmm. Did you go to the Congo during the crisis? No, no. Do you want to move on? Um, have you got any more to ask about Empire? Not just the Empire. the Empire. Would you like um, Would you like a break and a cup of tea, Neil? Well, how are we getting on? I mean... Uh, well, it's five o'clock. We've been going for about 45 minutes. We could have a quick break. If well, I'll have a five-minute break. Yeah. Right, we'll get my <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Neil, you also uh, spend quite a lot of time in Southern Africa. You said you met the dreadful Dirk Mudge and all those, uh, which actually turn out to be quite important negotiations. Many people now see them as kind of precursors of the idea of a, of a possible negotiated solution. Um, mm. You didn't see it like that at the time. It didn't seem like that at the time. No, no, no. no. Uh, Hugh Tracy. Yeah. Well, I knew Hugh Tracy because he... <coughs> well, he was a friend and patron, really, of um, John Blacking, who was right. a friend of mine, who I met at King's. Uh, and <coughs> Blackie was an anthropologist. Well, he was strictly, he was an ethno ethnomusicologist. Ethnomusicologist. Yes. Um, <coughs> Tracy, I think, was the first sort of founder of ethnomusicology, hmm. I suppose. And anyway, some, I don't know. But Tracy... Did Tracy found Gallo Africa, the records? I'm not sure if he found it, but he was certainly associated with it. And Gallo Africa was an important outlet for uh, for black music. Yeah, that was the thing. Yeah. And, and wonderful stuff. Not just South Africa, of course, largely Congolese. Mm. Yeah. And so at Cambridge, got to know John Blacking, and through him, Hugh Tracy, who came, <coughs> I remember him turning up, and was able to get hold of a lot of, well, quite a few Gallo Africa records, wonderful. So who was Hugh Tracy? I don't know. Jean Bosco Mwenda, guitarist. Hugh Tracy, I think he was, as you say, he was an ethnomusicologist. He did a lot of collection of um, music instruments. British or South African? I don't actually know. What, Tracy? Hugh Tracy, yeah. I he was South he, African, wasn't he? I thought he was. Yes, yes. <coughs> Maybe yes. wrong. Yeah. John Blacking wasn't. 
But John Blacking then got uh, into big trouble because of ethnic, uh, you know, he was done under the racist yes, for yes. having an affair with an Indian lady. Yes. I think he came to Oxford, didn't he settle in Oxford, if I remember correctly? I think he was at Cambridge. Cambridge. But then right. he, he settled finally in Queen's, Belfast. Right, right. <coughs> Excuse me. Were you, uh, I mean, when you when you say you knew, did you develop an interest in African music? Did you used to go to clubs yeah, and stuff like that? Yeah, I was that? crazy about it, yeah. absolutely. And because I have some of these Gallo Africa records. Oh, you must hang on to those. <laughs> I haven't any more. I mean, these were all 78s, you know. You should have hung on to them. A century ago. Yeah. But people used to come to my room as in Kings, you know, Africans from all kinds of different parts, just to listen. Did you go to clubs? No, no, no I, I never did that. I mean, I don't show there was African music in clubs, and certainly in Cambridge at that time. Not that I knew of. And what did you make of South Africa? Gosh. Um, well, the first thing to say about it is it's electric. I mean, the state of intensified raised consciousness among almost everybody of you know, every ethnic background was absolutely extraordinary. And, and you know, you suddenly began to live but twice as fast. Of course, this is under the apartheid regime. Um, much of what you're doing is either clandestine or sort of semi or taking some sort of risk or putting somebody else at risk or whatever it might be. You know. So uh, it was, yeah, I mean, in, in many ways, you know, I'd read so much about it already because I thought, when did I first go there? Oh yeah, I first went to South Africa in 1975, mm. that's right. Mm. But by then, of course, it, because Britain was so obsessed with South Africa, particularly the British media. Yeah. Uh, Why was that? I, I've been talking this morning to Fergal Keane about exactly that question, about why South Africa figured so strongly in the British imaginary. It's because the British were induced somehow to feel a sense of responsibility for it. Um, and of course that started in 1948 with the Africana, the Nationalist Party victory. You don't think that part of that was an expiation of guilt over a much longer engagement going back to, you know, to war. war, war, Zulu war yeah. and so forth? Well, I wondered about that. I don't think so, as a matter of fact. Mm. Um, I don't think so. I think that uh, British people were helped by media and politicians to settle back into quite a complacent feeling about their relationship with South Africa. But that's exactly what I mean by expiation, the, the complacency. Or expiation for the complacency. <laughs> okay, okay. But I mean, wasn't it convenient for many British people to say there's this terrible thing called apartheid and it's run yeah. by Afrikaners, uh, who are these uh, 17th century Calvinists who don't know better, need to learn the ways of the modern world. And so, I mean, that was very much the tenor of Macmillan's address in Cape Town. Um, it may be that the so-called reconciliation with uh, the Afrikaner community, which was followed the Boer War, um, only went skin deep. Oh, I think it went very deep. I think it persuaded you many British people. I do, I do. I think that that was the making of the Milner Kindergarten and many of the schemes that we see later on in Central Africa and so forth um, are built on an idea that these very clever British undergraduates who served Milner, having understood the power of colonial nationalism and having brought the great 1910 union into being could now practice this kind of high-level negotiation um, at many different levels, including the Commonwealth, yeah. including um, a view of decolonization and so forth. But uh, that's just my, my, my view. 
I see that. I was just wondering, but I think I think it was a wrong speculation to think that there were, in fact, still suppressed resentments about the enemy and the Boer War, which um, were lightly covered over by the reconciliation, and then sort of the nationalist victory in 1948 suddenly allowed these prejudices to spring to the surface again. That's probably quite wrong, though. Um, well. But let's let's start in the seventies. So you you go to you go in the seventies. By that time, there's a new, as it were, view of led by academics, but also journalists. You may know Jonathan Steele, yeah, very well. Christopher Gurney, people like that, who were advancing the idea that actually Britain's relations with apartheid were fundamentally about supporting a capitalist system, and that the true the true ruthlessness of apartheid was not just about race, but was actually about the defence of an economic system in which Britain was was complicit. Did you yeah. enter into those kinds of debates with people like yeah you did yes yes that's the, sure but I mean that's not the answer to why how rapidly after nineteen forty eight British public opinion became agonised by what was happening in South Africa. Which is very strange. I mean, of course, in many ways, very fortunate, or you know, admirable, or whatever you, or appropriate. Nonetheless, it is rather strange, and it needs explaining. Mm. I think it does. I think it is strange, and I think it does need yeah. explaining. Um, one of the things that I sometimes show students, you probably remember, a writer called H. V. Morton, who wrote yeah, lots sure. of books called In Very Search well. Of and so forth. Do you remember as he tooled yeah. around his motor car? He actually moves to South Africa in 1948 um, because he? he wants to, because he thinks Britain is finished, uh, and he wants to join, uh, rather like those uh, post-war emigrants from Britain yeah. going to Rhodesia for the good life. He wants to. He actually identifies with apartheid. So I think that question of why. British sensibility moves against apartheid is an extremely interesting question and can't easily be answered through simple uh, responses as it was bad. I mean, the push was had a heavily religious flavour. Yes, and Michael Scott. Well, Michael Scott and other, you know, churches, other denominations, other religious leaders piled in very rapidly. And certainly the Observer newspaper was not the first. I mean, also, you can see that I mean, the old News Chronicle, for example, mm -hmm. run by Quakers, right? Which finally folded up when in the uh, modern. I think it folded up in about 1960. But uh, still, up to then, and then Daily Herald, as then was, and so on. So a lot of the press rapidly picked this up and were enormously critical. About what had happened, and yet you see, a few years before, there was little Princess Elizabeth going and forty-seven, yes, her, and tremendous complacency about this. I don't know if she ever met any blacks at all, no, <laughs> to any Africans in South Africa. But and everyone thought that was wonderful. And, oh, we get on so well, and you know, the name of Smuts was so wonderful, and everybody respected it. And then suddenly, it all changed very, very quickly. Well, it changes in stages. There's the treason trial, there's Sharpeville, um, and then there's the formation of the anti-apartheid movement. Did you have much contact as a journalist with people in the anti-apartheid movement in, in, Some, in Britain? Some, yeah. Um, and what was your view of anti-apartheid as an organisation? Well, <laughs> the, the movement, the, I mean, the masses of decent, high-minded, idealistic people on the street, great. And they were wonderful. Um, when you got down to some of the leading figures, particularly some of the representations in London, um, then it became dicey because, of course, some of them turned out to be double Asians, as you know. Yeah. Um, but I, 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 I sense from what you're saying, it's not just looking at the double agents. There was something perhaps about some of the leaders that you, you didn't like or disapproved of or felt was... No, I don't think so. No, I mean, there was nothing about the anti-apartheid movement that I, that I thought, looking by, was it? Did you feel it odd that there were so many white people involved in the anti-apartheid movement, representing the ANC, for example? I 
I, I don't think I did really. I think it was, I sort of assumed there were so few Africans, South Africa, there were any other Africans around in Britain at the time. But certainly the kind of ANC element in it was, I mean, they then developed, of course, as you remember much better than I do, I'm sure, a series of intricate and savage quarrels. The Kitsons. The Kitsons, the, Norma Kitson, David Kitson, yes. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And these were, and it involved with um, Ruskin College, wasn't it, mm -hmm. as well. And this embittered a lot of people. They became involved with all kind of sectarian underground people trying to cut each other's throats. You know? It was very much a product of the particular exilic moment and particular interpretations, whether you're a Trotskyist or a Marxist or yeah. a nationalist mm. or an Africanist or a Pan-Africanist and so forth. Yeah. Did you, did you but, get, hmm? you knew the Kitsons? I think I met, yeah, a little long ago. I did meet one of them. Um, I think I met him, but I don't remember well. I didn't, yeah, I think so. Did you meet uh, Oliver Tambo, Joe Slovo? No, I uh, didn't. No. Those people. No. I, I, I know we're not going to talk about this the rest of the afternoon, but if you can just skip ahead to 1994, you write an absolutely, if you don't mind me saying so, I read it last night, brilliant piece at the 1994 inauguration of Mandela. And you have, I can't remember exactly the formulation, but you have one of those kind of undergraduate essay um, ready characterizations of Mandela. Partly you say that he has the fortune, I think, of timing. You talked about timing. I think you you don't seem to have been quite so uh, impressed as many journalists were by, uh, by the charisma. There's a certain kind of hesitancy that you have. I don't remember that. I don't remember that piece, actually. I shall have to dig it up. I shall have to. I mean, it's a brilliant piece. Uh, it's a wonderful piece. Well, thanks for saying so, but I don't recall it. Yeah. And I don't recall feeling reservations about Mandela, no. Um, I may have felt reservations about what was going to happen or, mm -hmm. um, or whether things could be kept under control or whether, you know, there's going to be some massive backlash or whatever. <coughs> but that's different. I think you make the point that he was an idea as well as a, as well as a, as a, as a political person. Uh -huh. um, but I, I, shall, I shall dig that up. But maybe we want maybe. to I can't remember it. go back in time a bit. But I used to, you know, the other people I knew in, in South Africa, which was so, of course, so different, because some of the people in the, in the you know, Durban, Natal trade union movement, the, you know, underground movement, in the night, the Durban strikes, the the, yeah. the, the, the 1973 strikes, that kind of thing. And there was, I can't remember, they, they tried to set up a new set of trade unions. Um, I think, particularly textile workers. That's right. Women. Yeah. And there was, yeah, Fosia, frame, the frame factory. Fosia. Fosia. Fisher. Yes. Who was married to Rick. Rick Turner. Turner. Did you ever meet Rick yeah, Turner? Yeah, I did. I had a long talk with him. What yes. did you make of Rick Turner? Oh, he's terrific. Actually. Can you say more? But he's now a figure that people are very interested in. Of course, he had that relationship, close relationship with Steve Biko, and they used to spend a lot of time yeah. arguing. Yeah. What did you make of Turner? He was well, a philosopher. Steve, He'd been in Paris. Of, yeah, Steve Biko was out with my knowledge. I mean, I never came across him. Um, but... What I remember about uh, Rick Turner is how much I liked him and admired him. I thought he was excellent, you know. Um, but that was probably about a, year, a month or a year or a year before he was killed. And yeah. I thought his book was very good, also excellent, still is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then Fosia, who I first knew actually when she was doing trade union stuff in near Durban. And that was all sort of clandestine. You had to go there in the middle of the night, you know, these muddy roads. <laughs> 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 and then, of course, she came back here. And she was at the University of Kingston on Thames or something. 
I, I, I didn't follow up. That trail goes clo uh, goes cold for me She's over there. Um, but that's a that's a fascinating moment because that, in a sense, was the revival, uh, what they sometimes call the Durban moment now, uh, the revival of the sort of the modern anti-apartheid struggle. There was that sort of long a hiatus from the end of Sharpeville to about 72, 73, uh -huh. Durban strikes, black consciousness, um, 76, <clears throat> 77, uh, Soweto uprising, and then of course yeah. the re-emergence of, 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 of trade unionism in the 1980s. So that's an incredibly important time to be yeah. there. Um, but I think we're, we're, we're running ahead and you want no, to... No, it's fine. But take us back. You start talking about South Africa and go on. <laughs> yes. All, all right. It, says, it wasn't part of our script. No, no, it's, of course it's it, part of our script. Everything oh. in there. No. I know. I know. What did you think of the African National Congress as an organisation? Or... Well, I mean, I didn't come across them except in London. Um, where it had some, I can't remember, I got, I got it the wrong side of somebody. I think I may have said the wrong thing about one of the Kitsons or so. It's one of these contested, bruised areas which developed. And I got violently denied by somebody who afterwards turned out to have been a boss agent. I can't remember what his name was now. Um, was in charge of the it could have been Gordon Winter? No, it wasn't him, no. It was somebody else. Anyway. Did you like South Africa? Did you like being a journalist there? Yeah. I mean, you have moments of horror and wishing you were anywhere else, you know, yeah. occasionally. I mean, I got, I think that you do get terrible moments. I mean, that's inevitable. I got a bad time in, in down some months actually in the airport because they, I got arrested at one point. Because they did this thing, which they call uh, uh, your visa exemption is withdrawn. It sounds all right. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> so I sort of locked into this tract until they could put me on a plane to anywhere else, you know. Well, day. this was a bureaucratic culture that was able to do, invent phrases like uh, foreign natives and so forth. So, <laughs> <laughs> But once it, I tell you something, I really... I really learned all kinds of things in South Africa. And one of the things, I'm sorry. No, 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 go on. No, no, no. One of the things I learned was about what I call the labor pump, which is how it works. And because, in fact, if you look carefully, you can see this in many parts of the world in different contexts, which is that you, okay, you have a developed, industrialized core. Uh, it needs labor. But because it's capitalist, it doesn't need labor, it's a steady pulse, you know. So it goes up and then suddenly you don't need it anymore. How do you get rid of it? Uh, you don't want to pay their the unemployment benefit, you know. So they have to be sent back to their own countries. Suppose they don't have any countries. Suppose their country is your country, okay? You have to change that bit of your country into their country. You have to create foreign yeah. countries for them yeah. to go back and, you know, so you don't and they have to take charge of their fate, see. So you have organized this, and you have to bring them in when you need them, and then when you don't need them, you look at how the economy is going <laughs> back into the homelands where somebody else has to pick up the tab, you know, and then you bring them back when you need them. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Like this, you've mm -hmm. got everything that you need, you see, the supply of labor, and you're saving money on their expenses and everything. and. Uh, it's terrific. <laughs> the rule is that labour pumps leak. Uh -huh. They all <laughs> leak. And this is what the Germans did, you see, the West yeah. Germans. Well, I guess that right. Because they set up a labour pump system uh, with, well, okay. initially with Portugal, Italy, mm. Yugoslavia, you know, mm. and eventually with Turkey. And they thought, oh, really, these people are all just like South Africa. They're all on sort of fictional contracts. Uh, well, fictional. They were supposed to be on the own contract so that when um, their services weren't needed, right, they could be sent back. Of course, it leaked. Mm. And 
within a few years had a million tonics living in West Germany. That's a very good image. And you, 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 you... But that's a system, you know. I've realized that this is one of the ways in which capitalism works. It needs, you know, really foreign, uh, foreign countries of a far lower standard of living in a periphery. And this is how you operate, if you can. But in the long term, it never keeps working. It always blocks, leaks. Yeah. They settle. I'm going to borrow that image for my teaching. Thank you very much. I like it, the pump. And you formulated the that leaky in pump. the leaky pump. You, uh, you formulated that in, in South Africa. It wasn't in, you, you, you came to that view in South Africa and then applied it to Germany. It wasn't yeah. the other way around. Yeah, no, yeah. in South Africa. Yeah. yeah. Always dignified as in, 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 in theoretical terms as the cheap labor thesis or the, uh, the rural subsidy or the, the might and, and so forth. But I like the pump. I like the pump. It's a good one. The labor pump. Particularly the leaky one. The yes. leaks. Okay, let's move to poor little Britain. Here we are. <laughs> 12th of March. Mm. Ah. Yeah. Um, I suppose uh, the general question I have really is about what connections you think about the end of empire and Brexit. Um, because by and large, the journalists, yeah, the, the main journalist trope really is that um, there's this nostalgia for empire mm. and or loss of empire, and that explains Brexit, which I kind of I've never been been won by, because I think it explains everything and explains nothing. That is so abstract, and it needs yeah. If one's going to follow that route. It needs kind of hitting, but you know, you sent me that um, the piece from nineteen eighty five on Westland. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. um, Vaguely. And you begin saying that during the Westland crisis, you just couldn't. You fell about laughing at the cynicism and the pantomime and the appalling nature of the British government. Mm. Well, blimey, you know, 20 years on, or 30 years on it is, or 40 years, whatever, you know, things are even worse. Well, and Heseltine is, <coughs> rather than being a pantomime act, it now seems like the kind of lost elder statesman that um, has a sort of redolent of a much greater moment of British politics. Yeah, well, look, I mean, I have struggled to be convinced about a, about a connection between loss of empire and Brexit. Uh, I don't think that the English people's reaction um, in the 2016 referendum is, a, is, is particularly post-imperial. I think it is a reversion to old attitudes of traditionally fairly mild xenophobia mm. but an intense dislike of the idea that somebody else is ruling the English and that somebody else is making their laws um, exactly what Enoch Powell predicted would happen um, and I suppose you could say stretching it a bit that what Powell was saying was, well, in his kind of nineteen fifties and early sixties, he said, "I see, you know, the English are still nostalgic about empire. They go on whining about their great world position that was still a world power, and so on and so forth. Snap out of it, yeah, because it is over. It is over." Um, it doesn't mean that he was not deeply, passionately proud of the British Empire. Of course, he was parties, and his wife, Helen, who was a tremendous goer, very lively, and his ADC, he was a charming fellow. And so, I'm sorry, we knew each other anyway. 
You also, I think, knew, you mentioned David After, the political scientist. Yeah. Who's written about that episode of the Kabaka. And if I remember correctly, After says that Cohen basically fires the Kabaka in an attempt to bring a modern nation into being, but this misfires terribly. Uh, this backfires as the Kabaka stages a revival. Were you involved in that, or did you have a view of that episode? Yes, I think I, I forget exactly what happened, but I think that's true. It certainly <coughs> it was kind of disabling for Andrew Cohen that he felt he had to do this. He didn't want to do it, as a matter of fact. I don't think the impulse, I think the impulse came from the colonial office. And eventually he had to obey orders. It's, that's how I understood it. But he lost an enormous amount of you know, affection and prestige among young Ugandans you know, at that point who before had liked and trusted him. And at, at, a, at a broader level, yeah. I mean, you'd been in Malaya. Did you have a, a view? Did you have a view about African national independence? I had a view about everybody's independence. I mean, having been in Malaya and seen it, well, having seen, I mean, on the way out, because in those days you went out and a troop ship took a month. So you went through a succession of British colonial contacts. First of all, the Canal Zone, you know, oh my God, and then Aden, and then, you know, brief halt in Colombo, and then finally Singapore, and then up into the peninsula. So yeah, I'd already seen quite a lot. <laughs> uh, I've seen the way that uh, people who got on board at Liverpool who were insignificant, boring little people, as soon as you know you got through into the canal, they suddenly began to somehow swell <laughs> in size and strut and put on khaki shorts and um, tell you uh, th things in uh, local dialects. And <laughs> I remember going with an abominable little guy like that in Aden, you know, and we were surrounded by little boys asking for money and so on. He said, I'll show you something. They're all superstitious. And, uh, you know, it's just that if you give them the, what do you call it, uh, it's on the devil side, it's the black, oh, what's the word? Um, it's that. You know? The gesture? Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. It's, it's just the expression's gone out of my head. <clears throat> anyway, you do that, and you just watch, and he did that, and they, they sh went grey, shrank, disappeared, and he sort of laughed in a contented way. I really hated him. <laughs> that was the start of it. When you got to Malay, of course, you saw what a colonial situation was made of. Mm. And that, in that particular context, it was made of the um, disenfranchisement of half the population, mm. the Chinese, who were not allowed to vote if they were uh, out with the whole state provision, you know, if they wanted hospitals, they had to build them themselves, if they wanted schools, they had to organize and build them themselves, and so on. So all that, and also, but can, can I just ask, because yeah. you, you, this is very, very interesting. I'm just trying to, you know, we've talked about Scotland a bit. I mean, do you have, at that point, would you say, I mean, you're giving us wonderful texture and the racism and the, the description that you're just giving us, that kind of casual sense of superiority. Do you have a, did you have a, set, a view about African national independence? You'd been in Malaya, you, you, you were obviously aware of India, you a child of, of, of Scotland. Did you feel that all of Africa needed, deserved, required independence, yes. or were you you you, you had a a, a a view? It seemed absolutely obvious. Obvious, yeah. Yeah, I thought you know empire is crap, wrong. Um, I should have been maybe thought about it more deeply about the imperial mission and improving people's lot and were they ready and all this stuff, but to be honest, I never did. It just mm. seems so obvious. Mm. People ought to be independent. Of course, in the case of Uganda, it turned out with some bitter ironies. I've got, I've got a couple of things to ask specifically about um, Malaya. Mm. You arrived in 
you disembarked in Singapore in 1950 or 51? And, 51, yeah. And you, you, you say that, or you give the impression that you were unsettled by, you know, the white population, that you didn't fit in and you knew you didn't fit mm. in. Do you have any memory of how the white settlers talked about um, the defeat of Singapore? Was that still an active memory at that time in, amongst the settlers? I thought about that, and the answer is I never ever came across anybody who mention. talked about it. Um, there, I'm sure there were intelligent people and colonial civil servants in Singapore and Malaya who thought deeply about it. I don't met anybody Good except um, only in the context of um, some intense bitterness towards Sikhs in particular. The Sikh population, not very big, mm. but they were used in a particular role. They were kind of policemen, uh, junior police officers, and they were very large, brutal. And uh, they had evidently worked with some enthusiasm with the Japanese uh, and led to the arrest, disappearance, death of quite a lot of white people, probably. <laughs> Apparently, anyway, they would resent it. Right. It was still being used in that role once more. Right. But basically, everybody had attempted just to return to as it all was yeah. before. I'm interested in the silences which the imperial burden reproduced and carried. So it is interesting for me that that was the defeat of Singapore was just not talked about. The question which follows from that. You must have seen some horrible things and probably did some horrible things in Malaya. When you found you came back to the Metropole, came yeah. back to Britain, were you able to talk to anyone? Or when you were coming back on the ship, did you talk amongst yourselves about yeah. what had happened? And, or was it, you know, there are these stories about people coming back from the men coming back from the war. Yeah. and actually couldn't speak about it at all to their families. I just wonder if there was something similar on your return from... So I had a sort of breakdown on the ship coming back, in fact, okay. because the commander was being transferred uh, to Malta. Mm -hmm. And I just... I don't remember exactly how it was, but I remember I was in floods of tears because I felt... There was nobody I could... I was trying to tell somebody, I think it was it, either the medical officer or a padre, that I, I, I couldn't find anybody I could talk to who understood, you know, nothing like that. And whoever it was was quite cheerful and said, never mind, you'll soon be back in Britain and you'll, everything will be different, you'll be okay. Um, but that was... Uh, yeah, I remember that. And probably that was just the usual post-conflict stress. And then you, you came back to Britain and yeah. did people, were people curious about Malay and what you've been doing? And Vaguely, uh, not all that much. I mean, the thing was, a part of a generation had all been doing this. I mean, one of the, something I do remember vividly is I'd been at uh, an officer cadet school during my national service. And uh, with the Marines, very reluctantly had to do officer cadet training with the army, and uh, known a lot of people there. And uh, when we came to the end of the course, there was our postings, so we were all assembled, all my platoon, you know, about fifty boys, in a hut, and the officer then read out our postings. Now, what had happened? <laughs> we, Royal Marines, we were exempt. We, you know, the Royal Marines told us what we were going to do, but they had all chosen to be in their daddy's old regiment or something like that, you know. Uh, and in fact, as you read out, silence, really, because every single one of them was sent to a battalion going to Korea. Wow. And um, they took no notice of a choice at all. And then, you know, whatever it was, two years later, I was here, and the first lecture I went to, and um, the first a few days I was there, I was in the Mill Lane lecture rooms, and 
a whole mass of mostly boys, one or two girls, no doubt, but all jostling outside the doors before they were open to get into the amphitheatre. And I recognised one or two, we recognised each other. So what happened? You know, and, that, and I didn't realise how many people had been killed, you know, mm -hmm. how many people didn't make it. Mm -hmm. Awful lot, because of Korea. Mm -hmm. There's a new book out, incidentally, uh, by Christopher Bailey, posthumous. We were sorry, Christopher Bailey, Chris Bailey, um, remaking the modern world. He, it's, it's sad, posthumous. He died in 2015. It's a history of the 20th century, and one of uh, one of the arguments that he makes in the book, he tries to reperiodize the Second World War. The Second World War for him begins in the 30s with uh, uh -huh. Abyssinia, and also with Manchuria. And it doesn't end in Nagasaki and Hiroshima. He talks about small wars of fragmentation or wars from below. He includes Malaya. He's thinking of Korea. He's talking about, it's really a history of the 20th century told from the point of view of war and violence. And he's mm -hmm. arguing in a sense that the war continues, at, seen at a global level, way past 45. Well, I mean, I think that's overlooking the sheer scale and intensity of World War II. I've just been out last week in, in Dieppe and uh, took a book with me about the Dieppe raid in 1942. Oh my God, mm -hmm. you know what happened there and what didn't have to happen. Mm -hmm. Oh, I mean, of course there were small wars went on, but the colonial wars, I don't think I wouldn't say that they're part of an identifiable continuum, a single long event starting in the 30s and going through into the, into the 50s. No, he's not saying it's a single event, and obviously, but I, he's trying to decenter de the European-Eurasian war mm. and to talk about a much longer cycle of, 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 of violence. But I mean, I'm just throwing this out because in a sense you are, I mean, you, you're in Malaya, I think you're in Cyprus, uh, you're in Aden as well, so you've encountered all, you know, several hot post-colonial hotspots. Oh, Kedia too. Saw that in the Mao Mao period. Right. Um, briefly. I mm. uh, had to go across it to get to Uganda. <laughs> right. And then, of course, much later, um, Rhodesia, Namibia, or Southwest Africa, as it was in South Africa and so on. But that's much later. Yeah. As a journalist. So you, by then you were working for the Observer or the Scotsman? Well, both, in fact. Uh, part of the time Observer, and then for another part of the time the Scotsman. Mm. And what was the ethos of those two newspapers? You obviously knew Astor, David Astor. Yeah. Um, I mean, you, you, you've said that you were almost an instinctive supporter of post-colonial independence. Mm -hmm. uh, did you... Ha Around the newsroom, was were there that that kind of sympathy in the Observer and the Scotsman? Oh yeah, hundred and fifty percent. I mm. mean, that was one of the interesting things about the Observer. It mm. had so three. It had three, under David Astor. I mean, starting I suppose in the fifties, it developed three aims that it wanted to see. One was decolonization of the British Empire. Two um, was a peaceful settlement between East and West in the Cold War. And the third was, odd as it sounds, planification <laughs> in the French moment. Mm, yeah. um, so the observer was derided and in fact was detested by British governments, particularly Tory governments, because of its passion for um, African nationalism, you know. And we had this superb correspondent, Colin Legion, Mm. They have come mm. across cool. the plan, yeah. Who uh, was, uh, I mean, admirable man, hugely arrogant, <laughs> but wonderfully well connected. I and mean, he knew. He he founded the the Africa Bureau, didn't he? No, Michael Scott did. Michael Scott, but did he not work with the Africa Bureau after Scott? I think you know the funny. It's funny you say that. I think he was slightly distant about the Africa Bureau. See, Michael Scott was the person who got to David Astor first right. and said, you must understand what is happening. 
in South Africa, above all, you know, and put him onto the whole, then, then developed the whole feeling about decolonization really came so Scott was particularly interested in Namibia and, and was one of the key people in taking the Namibia question Scotsman. to the United you know, Scott, Michael Scott. Oh, Michael Scott, yes. Was one of the key people in, 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 in publicizing the Namibia issue um, at the United Nations. He was, but also, I think also South Africa. And South Africa, yeah. yeah, That's yeah. later. Yeah. That's right, yes. Yeah. Did you ever meet him? Yes, I did. Um, he was quite a forbidding person to meet silent, gaunt, rather intimidating, you know. and of course his extraordinary reputation, so we were all in awe of him. You never met Mary Benson by any chance, did you? Yeah, I have, yes. Because I just read her autobiography, I should have read it earlier, and she had a, a sort of uh, a platonic love affair with, uh, with, 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 with Michael Scott. Yes, I know nothing about how far that went, but one <laughs> thing, I mean, she was quite a warm human being, I remember. She's quite clear it went nowhere because she said that Michael Scott made it a condition of their relationship that there would be or could be nothing personal, that's the word, but... Uh, yes, I can, I can believe that. Yeah, but so he had a, he had a, he, he had a charisma. He had an extraordinary charisma, I mean, he was very lonely. Um, and you felt that. He was very ill as well. Yeah, he was, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's right. But he, the Africa Bureau, and uh, there was a kind of nest of subversive organisations in a place called Denison House, which is a scabby old building somewhere in the corner of Victoria Street, mm -hmm. near Victoria Station. And it contained all kinds of things. Um, like the organ, what's the organisation for democratic control? Um, oh, yeah. uh, the uh, oh, commander Tommy Fox Pitt and the Aboriginal Protection Society and all these people, they all knew each other of course and intercommunicated with them but the Africa Bureau was the, mm -hmm. probably the most important and central tenant of that block. And, and did you have a, sorry, did you have a, I mean by now you uh, just before the wind of change, Central Africa Federation, mm. crisis. Uh, did you have a sort of view of a sort of sequence of uh, what had to happen before Rhodesia, South Africa, Mozambique, those late de de decolonizing states should, uh, should, should fall? I mean, did you? Yes. Uh, I mean, did I? I mean, obviously I saw the the British Empire version of decolonization, how it happened, you know, and the hauling down of the flag and shaking hands and all the gentlemanly handover and so on, pretending that unpleasant events had never happened and all that. Uh, but I'd also been in Algeria and... Uh, when were you in Algeria? Well, at the, uh, twice in Algeria. I was in, but most, the first time, much the most important to me, was at the end of the war. It was at the time of the ceasefire when things were coming to actually the killing was reaching <laughs> intensity and hadn't hardly touched before because it was involved in the struggle with the mm. OAS mm. as well, FLN, French Army, everybody was trying to kill everybody and Algiers was I was just writing up my diaries, oddly enough, a few days ago, went back to them and I typed them up. I've just finished typing up my memories of Algeria. But again, yeah, you look at that and you see, well, you learn a few things, particularly about a, a settler community um, in which you know, there are settler communities in which the settlers find a way to make their peace with the situation, and others where they bloody well don't. And of course, as you know, what happened in Algeria Mm -hmm. which is a 900,000 pieds noirs, mm -hmm. of whom only a minority was the French background, really, um, bolted and planted up in France. 90,000, well, I don't know how many, the Haki, you know, the, mm -hmm. of whom the FLN probably killed about 50,000, and some 90,000 got to France. 
Um, I just want to go back, we're sitting in Cambridge, yeah. I want to go back to this thing you've talked about many times before, when you arrived in King's on your first night, you know, and you were wearing some insignia from the Royal Marines. A medal, yeah. A medal, and then there's that um, engagement with Hobsbawm, and uh, it's a very moving story, very moving episode, but you tell it in different ways. And I, the last version I've read mm. is you say um, that you were wearing it in the kind of, or with the unconscious hope that someone would tell you to take it off. Yes. Um, but when you were just saying a moment ago that actually on the ship back you had a kind of breakdown, mm. how do you put those two things together? Or do you not put them together? Well, I don't think they were the same at all. I mean, the that kind of breakdown on the ship. I could, I was never fully. I couldn't really understand why I felt like I did um, at the time. I just felt, you know, nobody understands me, and there's nobody I can talk to, and nobody reads books. You know, I like my marine officer comrades and all this sort of thing, but that's, you know, it's obvious I can't communicate with them. Um, of course, obviously, looking back, there was a lot more behind it. I was already, I mean, perfectly well aware after a month or two in Malaya that the situation was an unjust one. I wouldn't say so far as I felt I'm on the wrong side, right? but I felt that the other side had a point, <laughs> put it like that. So, and so this, so I had already, I wrote letters to my mother about this, uh, saying, could you show, because she knew a Tory MP, who was quite an intelligent man. Actually. Who was that? He was called Cedric Drew, no. undistinguished, but a nice guy. I said, but can you want to read this? I want him to you know, understand how bad the situation is and how it could be remedied, you know, what could be done to create some justice for the Chinese community above all. Um, so I was already involved in trying to, to change things. Um, so I had, uh, but I suppose deeper than that, was, a feeling that, okay, you can write nice letters saying this is all wrong, but the fact is the next morning you're going to go out with a gun and do the thing. And so that's what eventually catches up with you, I suppose. But when you're in, when you arrived in Cambridge, are you persuaded by your own exp explanation that you wanted, or you needed other people to tell you to... Well, it's, it's in retrospect, it was afterwards I sort of looked at my own behaviour of this incident with Eric Hobsbawm, you know, and um, I realised that, that in a, I just felt he'd, look, he'd been asking, why did you put that thing on? It was a provocation. Didn't you realise it was a provocation, you know? So, yeah, to which you, you thought? Well, when he said that, what did you think? Well, it wasn't conscious provocation, but looking back subconsciously, I was looking for somebody to yeah. say, um, what you did was wrong, right. you know. And then Daniel Ellsberg was there as well. Yeah, but that was, <laughs> <laughs> it took me sort of 30 or 40 years <coughs> before I was picked up that we'd both been there, yeah. Mm. Going back, just picking up this idea of uh, the, the, the sympathetic or the uh, uh, Tory MP, mm. um, what did you make of uh, the sort of liberal Tories, if one can call them, the McLeods and running up to Macmillan and so forth, um, wind of change? Did you take them seriously? As yes, you did? yes. Um, I was on the Scotsman then and I was there. Commonwealth correspondent for one terrific year based in London, which was the year 
1959 through 60. Uh, it was a great year because all sorts of things were happening. And it was the year of the Nyasaland riots, which finally uh, it was the first real big nail in the coffin of the Central African Federation. And this was done by the Scotsmen, really, um, because they, I was, it wasn't my agency, but the thing was that um, as soon as the riots exploded, the British government went into a sort of panic mode, really, because they could see the implications. If this was going to happen, the Federation was going to work, because it all depended on you know, black Nyasaland submitting to a white-dominated southern Rhodesia. If they didn't do that, the whole manner would work, and then northern Rhodesia, also black, would go up as well with the top of that. So they were panicking. So they immediately locked down everything, and there were no communication, no journalists were allowed there. Um, and uh, I think the post <laughs> stopped all kinds of things, and state of emergency, and the British government put out an extraordinary series of documents, which I think were fake, actually, about a murder plot. Yeah. Which, you yeah. remember that. And um, uh, at that point, <laughs> of course, as you know, Nyasaland is very special to Scotland, because it's the uh, Livingston. Livingston, of course. He did a lot of his work. <laughs> and. Uh, it's where the Church of Scotland then yeah. settled in, so the place is covered with Scottish place names, mm -hmm. Blantyre, so Livingston, <laughs> that's it. Um, so what happened was that the Eric Mackay, the London, was then the end, London editor, later was the editor, uh, got the idea, he said, well, of course I know a lot of these people there, and I was at school with them, Aberdonians, and uh, so we decided to ring up the Reverend Andrew Doig, and I can't remember, Livingstonia or somewhere. <laughs> so they booked a telephone call, and it took three days to come through. <laughs> and but he did come through, and uh, I'm sorry, this is, I'm going on too long. No, no, no it's a oh, great story. Oh, please, come. It was, we all when it, if I came through and. Eric risked the phone, you know. We all crowded into the open door of his office, like that, you know. And it was uh, all, um, hello, Andrew, is that yourself? <laughs> aye, aye. Oh, very well, very well. <laughs> and how she, you know, oh, so very funny, aye, aye. That was great. Well, very, very good. Oh, Andrew, you know, eventually, uh, <laughs> finally. He got through and he got down to it and Andrew Doig started dictating these absolutely devastating series of articles in the Scotsman about exactly what was happening, which was ferocious repression mm. um, and a lot of pack of lies being put out of the colonial administration. We started printing this immediately, um, the British government reacted and uh, then, after about two or three days of this, uh, we were sent for by, it was then Lord Hume, who was the Commonwealth Commonwealth Secretary. Secretary. And so we <laughs> went to see him in his office, in the Foreign Office building, you know, great dim chamber. And uh, he kept sort of trying to make us uh, stop Publishing, he asked Eric to stop publishing this stuff. And Eric was, he was just so angry, he couldn't speak. He just sat on the sofa, <laughs> his face frozen like that. And I remember Lord Hume walking up and down the room, just wringing his hands or whatever you call it like that, and saying, I appeal to you as fellow Scotsmen. <laughs> <laughs> 
And, and what was Hume? Was it did did it get to a point where he denied or said that the reports were inaccurate, or oh, was no. it no no? no. You, so it was it was simply that they were inconvenient. Just to shut up. Want you to shut up? Yeah, mm. yeah. Mm. But the, um, did you cover the Devlin Commission? I think he may have said it was irresponsible or only in color of courage for the disorder or something like that. You know, mm. the usual thing as they say. But the um, at the beginning of 1961, there was that great rebellion in the Conservative Party in Westminster amongst Walensky's mm. supporters. Yeah, he was. He's an imperialist, but he's also historically imaginative. He said, this period is ending. We're entering another period in which the English have to stop thinking of themselves as a great global super nation. Got to concentrate on Englishness. Concentrate, concentrate, concentrate until you have something so intense living and hard and brilliant, you know, that it will then perhaps again expound and do something incredible across the world. But for the moment, that's what you've got to do because, you know, the big global Britain is for the moment over. So it may be that in a funny way, and he, I mean, he always said uh, membership of the EEC, the European Community, will never stick with the English. Sooner or later, they'll say no, because they don't like being ordered about by foreigners. Very simple. I mean, in 1961, he gave this some, uh, speech on St George's Day, yeah. uh, which Tom then uses a lot in the breakup of Britain. And I've come back and read it, and he talks about at the heart of England, there is this memory of a vanished empire which is wonderful. That's not nostalgia for empire. And he was imperialist and colonial in his bones till he died. Mm -hmm. But he, you're absolutely right, he jettisoned all that. And he gives that speech at the moment that Macmillan is with Kennedy in Washington, uh, discussing with Kennedy, is it going to be okay with the State Department if we join the EEC? Mm -hmm. Yeah? So there was something extraordinarily and horribly prescient yeah. about Enoch Powell. Yes. Um, and out of that comes an entire racialized kind of ethnic populism. Um, a kind of xenophobia. And it's not that that happened, happened before in England. It happened in 1912 during the um, crisis about yes. Ireland and so on. And I think there are, there are continuities. They, yeah, they are they're interrupted, but there are continuities in different moments about um, a racialized right wing people against the state. Yeah, and I I would prefer to see Brexit in that lineage rather than some amorphous, abstract, unprovable nostalgia for empire. Yes, well, I you know? absolutely agree with that, and I like the way that you bring up 1912 because. Uh, 1912 to 14 is the previous occasion to Brexit, to what we're going through now. Well, when Parliament entirely lost control of a complex situation. Um, in fact, there are three complex situations in 1912 to 14, mm. which were converging uh, that Bacon saved by the war. Uh, this time, <laughs> not so. But it, it's interesting that that happened exactly as you say. I mean, it's, uh, there is a precedent, mm. but it's the only time when things happen when Parliament simply, the party was, system have, backs up. It, it, party it, system no one it. had any idea what to do no. in 1912-14. I've just, after 40 years, I went back and I read George Dangerfield mm. um, in order to understand what 1912 was about. Actually, reading it in Brexit times, it's like reading a commentary on the contemporary period. I mean, it is absolutely formidable. <laughs> and then, of course, when there is the kind of return of the repressed, and the only way Mrs May can survive is with the bloody DUP, I mean, the continuities are just extraordinary. <laughs> Except as, you know, as Vincent O'Toole argues in his book, 
there's no way that the DUP mm. is representative of anything apart from a tiny little coterie uh, you just of old reactions. Right. You have to stop and think, just a minute, <laughs> just a minute. What matters here, you know, you have a majority of population in Northern Ireland for whom being uh, separate from the UK to the extent of being part of the Gutsland Union doesn't matter. Yeah. You know, they don't. In some ways it's a wee bit worrying, but it's not overwhelming. Yeah. And it's not and and yet they are being entirely monopolistically ruled by this tiny group of little bits of antrium granite, you know, who are laying down the law and dominating the situation. And it is idiotic. Now, it's easy to say, well, okay, Northern Irish people uh, you all voted not to be in this situation. You didn't vote for the people who are putting you in this situation. So get down in the street and do something. That trouble is in Northern Ireland. You go down in the street, people, those people start hitting each other. Yeah. So you know, I see that it's difficult. Yeah. There's an argument for being passive, but it is ludicrous. Yeah. Well, I, I personally don't think the backstop is really what this is about. I think this is this has become the way in which it's mm -hmm. it's it's it's. Uh, I don't think it's about anything which people are saying it's about. It's right. not a new backstop. It's not Europe. I just think it's it becomes a vessel for everyone's anxieties. Yeah, which is partly why it's impossible, as Ireland was in nineteen twelve to nineteen fourteen. Yeah, yeah. It's when when politics just overflows and. Yeah, it becomes more complex than the institutions can handle. That's the situation we're in. Another thing which has struck me about this is Mrs May talking constantly about our precious, precious union. Mm -hmm. And I suddenly realised she, she means what she says. It's the union which is precious. She doesn't give us stuff about Scotland no. or Wales or Northern Ireland. No, she but doesn't. the union she does care about because it's a kind of abstract achievement vaguely on which her authority and her, you know, or style you, you, depends, you know, <laughs> the crown and the jewel and the crown, whatever it is, you know, so she does care about the union. She but the union, it's you. just become in, in her mind a red line. I mean, I, she doesn't understand it, she doesn't travel, she doesn't have any political sensibility outside it. She's a very I mean, can you think of a of another Prime Minister with such little self ability to self reflect well, uh, or historical um, I can think <laughs> one of the nicest ones who is John Major, who <laughs> I did who I did have a conversation with him when he was Prime Minister it lasted about five minutes or something. And uh, it was about devolution to Scotland, which was then, you know, in the air, or approaching, or thought about. And he said to me, um, look, I mean, all this devolution talk, it's rather loopy, really, because I know what it is. The Scots just feel left out of things up there, <laughs> and I ought to go there more often, and I really must tell my cabinet ministers that they should go there more often. It sounds like Prince Charles, doesn't it? It's exactly like Prince Charles. That. It's wonderful, isn't it? I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't say anything. <laughs> so, oh. <laughs> but there's, you know, the thesis which you and Tom Nairn and Xander put about um, uh, the kind of archaic nature of the British government and the way the parliamentary sovereignty just builds up the executive and breaks complete, completely any sense of popular sub subject. I mean, I'm going to have to read this out. This is from the same bit you wrote during the Western Crisis, when you talked about how Mrs. Satcher ran her cabinet. Yeah? And he says, um, uh, Mrs. Satcher's way of running her cabinet is in the manner of Stala, Stalin running his evening parties at the Dakar. She winds up the gramophone, her ministers dance together. Outside in the snow, the, vine, the van for Siberia 
waits with the engine running. <laughs> I mean, honestly, that made me laugh. It chilled my blood as well. Because what you see in Mrs. Hatcher in her dependence on the executive, mm -hmm. of course, is redoubled now with Mrs. May. You know, she's the except she's the, she and Ollie are the only people in the cabinet. You know, these other people she doesn't even care about. She can't handle. So. It is catastrophe. Well, these contradictions. I mean, the great sort of dialectic contradiction about Mrs. Thatcher was precisely you know she wanted to shrink the state, shrink the state, free everything up. You see. And, uh, People who want to shrink the state, expand the state. Yes. Because, yeah. you know, it's like I always feel that they say, well, what we want is a, a free market, free, unregulated market. It's exactly the unregulated market which need the police. Yeah. You have a regulated market where everybody knows whose store exactly. is this Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. It's more or less okay. But once you say, well, you know, I'll leave it to you, uh uh, you know. You need the strong state. Yes, Mr. Big is going to be there in no time, and you need, and there are going to be fights, and you need far more police. You need the strong market. state. Then you need a regulated one. You do. And you need a strong state to run a free yeah, economy. That's right, exactly. And this is Thatcherism, you know, the, the other part of it, with the, of course, the withdrawing of, 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 of power from local authorities, you know, in favour of the central state. When you talked so, about um, Mrs. May's union, unionism, and, um, you know, what she imagines by that. I fear there's a terribly easy answer to what her unionism involves. And it's certainly not Scotland, the Wales and Northern Ireland. Mm. It pains me to say this. It's maidenhead. You know, that is what she regards as the unionism. It is a kind of displaced nationalism. Yeah, English nationalism. I'd put in a word for Eastbourne. <laughs> no, I have to keep it at maidenhead because... <laughs> It um, sounds better. Well, you said, I think, no, it's just the feeling. I mean, look, okay, let's go back to this thing about empire, embers, mm -hmm. embers of empire and ghosts of empire and so on. I mean, there is undeniably, empire has left something. It's got, it's left a feeling that Britain, call it Britain, is not just a nation state like other nation states. Um, well, I would agree with you, and this is where I think that I don't well, think... Well, hold on, did you finish? Sorry. No, I mean, well... Uh, come on, please, come on. You know, the, the, the idea that this is just a medium-sized nation-state like France, Spain, Poland, you know, uh, deep down, certainly English people don't really accept that no. in, in, in their feelings. And why they don't... Uh, I mean, there, there is an argument. It could be that English exceptionalism has really profound roots, as Powell thought it did. Yes, right? but that's not an. That's but not it could not. be. It could be, you know, just a afterflow, of, afterglow of, of being a victor power of World War Two and having had a global empire. Yes, and, you know. But that's not an argument for nostalgia for empire. It is no, no. Empire is then an element in, in how that memory coalesces, mm. but it's not an argument for nostalgia for empire. No, because look, I, I there's stages of displacement. As a child, the when I was a school child, I certainly remember. I can't remember how old I was, thinking at some point, I don't believe it. I, why, why, am I, Neil Asherson? part of the most important, wonderful, good nation that ever existed, in the, you know, in the world. Why am I so privileged? Did you think that? Yes. Yes. I'm definitely a post-colonial child. I never thought that. Sorry, we interrupted you. Yeah. Well, this no, no, no. I was only going to say that that, yeah, you, that yeah. I mean, you, Bill's written a great deal about nostalgia. I mean, I think that we don't. The reason why nostalgia doesn't quite explain it is nostalgia needs quite an elaborate story and actually a, a, a joined-up historical consciousness, which I think is lacking. What I think we have now are examples of imperial reflexes, a sort of an angry reflex which comes out at various points which isn't very joined up. So when you have the Defence Secretary talking one moment about 
uh, putting the uh, sending it, sending the, the new aircraft carrier to to face up to China, and the next moment to putting the military on the streets to deal with knife crime, you're dealing both with an impoverished political mind, mm. uh, but also with someone who is dealing with reflexes. This is not joined up thinking, and it's made all the more um, it's made all the all the more tragic in these circumstances where the political class simply cannot respond in a, in a coherent way. And I do think there are examples of imperial nostalgia um, which intrude. And the Second World War for me is more, we talked about this in Brexit, the, 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 the memory of the Blitz and so forth is more part of uh, what is being imagined. But of course the Second World War was also a denial of empire and and a claim well, and, on empire. And affirmation as well. Um, it it, yeah. But, you know, nobody, no matter how you explain the glories of the Blitz, and we know mm -hmm. from all the novels and so forth that it was never quite so simple as it's made out, form of solidarity, that Britain didn't vote to be bombed. Um, and what we're going through now is, a, is an act of national self-harm. And that is what I can't understand. Well, that's Fintan at all, I can have you read the Fintan O'Toole book? Sorry? Have you read the Fintan O'Toole book? Yes, I have. Yes. Isn't that wonderful? What do you think? I think it's a lovely book. It's a wonderful book. I think it's over the top of that. No. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I just it feel that he was sort of slightly holding on to his feet as he flew up you know, <laughs> when he talked about how um, what the English really want is to be occupied by a vicious foreign nation who lock them all in concentration camps. I thought that was going a wee bit too far. Uh, I think he knows that. I think he I like was, it. Uh, yes, I do. Like it. <laughs> I like it. But it's very good. Yeah. But there is a there is a self. I mean, I've always felt that there is something about an Englishness. Uh, I don't know whether it's a perverted form of a particular dilute kind of Calvinism, which believes if it it's if it isn't hurting, it's not working. I mean, I think that was. Part an element of an underestimated element of Thatcherism, um, and I've never been able to quite explain or understand that. Do you do you know? Do you, do you, do you, do you? It wasn't working. What? If it's not hurting, it isn't working. Oh, I see. Uh. And I think that's part of what Finton is getting at. No, it is because he's, he's talking about well, the fun. Yeah. yeah, there's an element of that. There's an element of that. And one of the things which the yes. Uh, I mean, not the yes, the, uh, no. <laughs> the Remainers got wrong. Of course, and they're still getting wrong, actually, is uh, that nobody voted to get poorer. And uh, is the economy stupid? Because, of course, uh, the more you know about the leave vote, the more you realize that people were perfectly clear about the danger to the economy and to their standard of living. That there was one, it would probably mean rough years. Uh, but they thought it worthwhile for political ends. This is a political vote. Yeah, well, that's been made very clear in Sunderland and many other places. Mm -hmm. um, well, we're almost heading towards the, uh, the, the, the witching hour of seven o'clock. I've got a couple of final questions, if that's right. Are you still up for it? I'll try and answer them. You, you don't... Quickly. The first one, you don't have to answer them, but I'm going to put them. <laughs> you don't have to answer them at all. So you, Let's just, can we go back to here you are, aged 12 or something, when you go to Eton College, yeah? You come from the relatively comfortable middle class, is that yes. right? Yes. Relatively comfortable middle class. Obviously. You go to Eton, you then join the Royal Marines, mm -hmm. you end up at King's College, Cambridge University. Yeah. You. You know, that is a biography which we've seen in, you know, a thousand times of centred politicians and then they go into law or politics or whatever, yep. And I'm, my question is, to what extent is your, or has your affiliation to Scotland been a way of decentering yourself? Ah, yes. That's my question. It has been a part, yeah. yes. I think so, because my reaction to 
Well, it wasn't just to Eton, but it was to the kind of anglicised British upper classes, was that I didn't want to be like that. Mm. Uh, I didn't want to be identified with them. Mm. And so, yes, I mean, even when I was at Eton, I was trying consciously to associate with other Scottish boys, for example. Yeah. And to, you know, not to do things which would identify me with that kind of life or that kind of culture. And uh, so Scottishness certainly has been something to hold on to, because here I am. Yes, as you say, uh, I am <laughs> Scottish. I was entirely educated in England. Yeah. <laughs> not only that, um, because I was a scholarship boy, both, you know, from to Eton and from Eton to King's, I owe it all to one English Plantagenet king, <laughs> Henry the Sixth, and his endowments. <laughs> it was quite ironic. But, I mean, to be fair, I have, you know, getting slowly the other side of all this, as it were, to old age, a more balanced view, a more ironic view. Um, I have become much more of a, a fan and admirer of Englishness in many ways have you? than I was before. Yeah, I mean, Tom Nairn is, mm. uh, he really is quite sharply critical. I mean, he does find English not only foreign, but, but in some ways deplorable. He's got many, many English friends, of course. But um, I've come to you know, appreciate what England is and has a lot. Oh, that's interesting. Can you, can you just um, say something more about that? What is yes. it you appreciate? Uh, well, one of the things you said, I mean, my, I've had a long exposure in my life to Scottish politics, for example. And Scottish politics are rather like Polish politics or French politics. Or Irish politics, even. Not quite as dirty as Irish politics. <laughs> But um, the tolerance of the English is from pretty remarkable, uh, and it's as far in so far as tolerance exists in Scottish politics, it's an import commodity, you know. So, and, yeah. And you're saying this even in these very intolerant times. Yes. Yes. It's still. It's still there, really, and um, it's almost to do with a kind of indifference. Mm -hmm. It's to do with uh, that people have to imagine foreigners they hate, because they can't actually get round to hating the foreigners they know and meet. And that's always been a bit of an English thing. But the fact that nobody cares who the fuck you are, you know, living next door, or they keep themselves to themselves. Yes, it's true, I occasionally see them uh, going out covered with black veils, balaclavas, and carrying AK-47. <laughs> but, you know, that's their business. I mean, you know, they're always very good. They're very quiet at night. They don't give us any bother. <laughs> good. And that kind of thing, and, and it's... It's... Um, no, I mean, I, there's not a lot of that in the world. Okay. There really isn't. It's not just being incurious, it's about... I mean, Laissez-faire? Well, English people are kind in a way. I mean, Scottish people are very kind. Um, but they're particularly... <laughs> what I'm curious to say about Scotland is that I think Scottish people are find it much easier to be kind to strangers than to each other. Gosh. Um, I mean, why that is so is a, a long story. But, uh, in England, people instinct is to be kind. I don't, I would never regard English people for their kindness and certainly not for their kindness to strangers. It's not something which I recognise. I think I know what you're saying and I I mean, I think there's a kind of tolerance which comes out of an instinct 
for incorporation and a form of incorporation which never amounts to full assimilation. <clears throat> so the British traditions of indirect rule were different from the French mm -hmm. idea, Republican idea of assimilation, where you had to actually deal with the possibility, I mean, you were talking about Algeria, that foreigners could become us. Mm -hmm. I don't think the English have ever really thought mm -hmm. that foreigners no, no, no. should become us, no. but they're relatively easy mm -hmm. about foreigners being amongst us, and I think that that for me is the way I think about this, whether it's kindness or whether it's a kind of apathetic um, incorporation, I don't know. I don't know, when you read sort of people's memoirs, often of um, arriving here as refugees and how they were treated, um, of course they're bad cases, but a lot of cases are just people still 70 years on, just amazed and how people were, how good people were to them, you know. Not but, so much financially or anything, but just... But wasn't that also, you know, a 30s moment and a kind of belief in British constitutionalism and Westminster um, and the ability to... I, 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 I hear what you're saying, um, but I wonder whether that wasn't a very particular... It's true the Ugandan Asians would say that as well in the 70s. Um, not much at about if you're on the south coast towns. Uh, but it's also partly the predicament of you know, where you come from. And if it's from Idi Amin to end up in Gloucestershire, mm -hmm. I can see how that would be desirable. <laughs> Neil, I've got one last question, yeah. which again you can choose to answer or not. Um, it's a stupid question, but stupid questions don't always produce stupid answers. <laughs> If you were asked what kind of European you are, how would you begin to answer that question? <clears throat> Mongrel. Mongrel. <laughs> Mongrel and emotional. Um, I'm a European. I just have felt enormously proud, really, to be, to feel that I'm part, you know, through the European Union, actually organically connected now for the next 10 days or whatever it is to, you know, my Polish friends or people I know in Madrid. It means a lot to me. I've also got a lot of French relations um, for various reasons. <laughs> I've grown up with, with a, a lot of French family, but well, that's part of it too, but it's it's more. It's it's not a feeling of being European against anything or anybody or anywhere else. Uh, not even of being the. And it may be that that's un-European because you know, I've always noticed that almost every European country thinks it's the last bastion of European civilization against the next one East. Hmm. You know, but if, why do you think? I don't feel that. Why do you think that those sentiments, which are not unique to you, why do you think those senti sentiments are so have been so difficult to mobilise and articulate in the whole discussions about Europe? Because you know, I've hardly said heard a single hot soul. Well, I think it's say because what you've just said on yeah, yeah. ever on TV. Well, yeah. uh, let's go back to Europhobia and so yeah. on in England. Um, again, I think England's a special case here. It, it's part of the sense of control, whether you think that being European is a, is a, well, your relationship with other European countries and civilizations is something that you are in charge of, that you can affect. Um, English people clearly don't feel that at all. Mm. Um, Scottish people, I think, do in a quiet sort of way. Um, 
one of the things that was struck about France, for example, is that France intensely nationalist, arrogant culture, <laughs> after all. Why is it so deeply European? And the answer is because, well, one of the answers is that the French consider they invented Europe. It's theirs. So, in spite of everything, why do they, I mean, one of the things that, for instance, the British absolutely failed to understand, or baffled by, was uh, after Maastricht, I guess, was that the French gave up the franc. <laughs> uh, quite, you know, well, a certain amount of moaning and groaning, but they gave it up. People get it. How could they? <laughs> I mean, aren't they? Didn't they have this sort of patriotism? <laughs> more? And it's the French, the Swiss, the most nationalistic people on earth. What is it? You know, the answer is that, particularly since de Gaulle, but not only that, goes for much, much further back, back to Napoleon, really. The French know deep down that they invented Europe. Yeah. They invented the European Union. Yeah. You know, they invented, of course, you know, Roman law under Napoleon, which spread all over Europe. They, it's theirs in some sense, even if it turns against them, it's still, you know. I think they, um, they, they have a sort of sense of ownership and, well, I don't know about control, but a sense of power. They I feel think, empowered um, by Europe. The English anti don't feel empowered by Europe. I think the antagonism between Winston Churchill and Charles de Gaulle is extremely symptomatic in that sense, mm -hmm. you know, because de Gaulle was exactly that and Churchill just was furious that anyone should feel like that, mm -hmm. whereas Churchill himself felt that he ran the Anglophone world, you know. Mm -hmm. um, they couldn't talk to each other, you know, for 30 years, they couldn't, 15 years, 10 years, they couldn't talk to each other. <laughs> I've just finished the Julian Jackson biography of De Gaulle. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that? It's very fine. Have you seen it? It's a terrific book. Well, we've we've covered a lot of ground, and we've worked you very hard, Neil. And um, no, it's a pleasure. It's been a real pleasure. It's You've been our pleasure. Yeah. You've been fabulous. Thank you very very much. Well, thank you for talking. I mean, for asking the questions. <laughs> oh. I think the answers were probably better than the questions, actually. <laughs> I'm going to stop before we give, yeah, jump, yeah. flatter each yeah. other too much. Thank yeah. you very much, Neil. Oh, my, thank you.